Thank you so much for having me back in Vancouver. I moved to Penticton uh, about six months ago to live with my family of chickens uh, and to kind of take this idea of working locationally independently to the next level, which was all because the business that myself and my business partner, Annika, uh, we created to be 98% virtual. I had to do that. We said that we were 100%, but I'm here, which means that I can't be 100% virtual. Uh, so what do we do? We're working with workplaces in technology, uh, in social impact, sometimes in nonprofit, uh, and we're helping what I like to call reducing the emotional waste through individual and group coaching. Um, we help companies co-develop strategies for happy and engaged teams, and uh, we coach leaders to build beloved organizational cultures. Why do I care so much about this stuff? Well, there's a few reasons for me to care and a few reasons for you to care. Number one, I keep seeing something that's happening in the last couple years. Talent, super scarce. Who agrees with me? It's hard to find great talent, yes. Uh, a new report last year just came out that said uh, it has gone up to about, I think, 79% of companies are having a hard time finding great talent. And we keep saying that it's scarce. And the reason is, is because 89% of Canadian employees are willing to leave their current job for the right offer. But the right offer doesn't necessarily mean uh, more money or more status or a bigger job title. What I'm seeing a lot in the work that I do now is a heck of a lot of pain with people, feeling like their work lives and their personal lives just aren't integrated in a way that feels compelling and motivating intrinsically to them. So they're starting to self-select, like I did, self-selecting out of being told to fly to Boston to fire someone. That's what I got asked at one of the last places that I took a full-time job at. I went, you know what? Like Tracy said, I'm like, I quit. I quit, I'm burning out. This is not a good situation. We're not looking at like why and how we actually wanna work with each other. We're not looking at the humanity of things. I'm out of here. And I'm seeing this in so many of the people that I individually coach, which is one of the reasons we developed Talent Collective in the first place. We didn't start by working with businesses. We started working with individuals who were coming with so much pain. They were saying things like, I just really wish I had a flexible work environment. I wish that I could you know, take my kids to soccer practice or stay home with my child or um, travel. I just want to be able to live my life and produce great work. And the more I looked at knowledge workers and the more I looked at high performing people, so many of them were opting out because they wanted more autonomy, more mobility, and more flexibility. How, how many people have felt like they want more of that? Oh, everybody look around because some people put up their hands and I bet you the ones that didn't um, were kind of thinking it and maybe just were a little bit worried because they're around their colleagues. So, what's a 28, like 2018 strategy to attract this tech literate talent? Uh, so, debunk the myths that are keeping us behind uh, and provide some high level actions to attract some of this top talent. So, number one, let's talk about some work ethic stuff. So, who's heard this one? Remote workers aren't as invested, they don't work as hard when no one is watching. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being brave and putting up your hand. I appreciate that. I have thought this too because I have managed really large remote teams and have been guilty of being that manager thinking my team totally isn't working as hard as I think that they should. Uh, and uh, it comes a little bit down to communication, but we'll get to that in that next one. So what's the reality here? Home working has led to a 13% increase in productivity and higher work satisfaction. Who would like the people that they work with and maybe themselves to be a bit more productive? Yeah? Who would like to spend less hours being productive and more hours having their life? Okay. Good. Good. I love this. Thank you for the engagement. So I look at this. I've been tracking my time since 2012. When I worked full time, when I worked as a consultant, when I started my own business, it's the third business I've started, but when I started this own business. And what I saw was I have a much reduced number of hours worked. I work about six to eight hours a day. Oh my gosh, I know. Six to eight hours a day, those are all my billables. That's all the stuff I'm getting paid to do. 
And there's not much more. The admin stuff fits within that six to eight hours. How am I doing this? I get asked this all the time. How in the world am I being so productive? And I keep having to look back at how I'm not being distracted by other things. I'm not being distracted by uh, what I like to think of as a lot of emotional waste that happens in workplaces. I know none of us mean to do this, uh, but in workplaces, we tend to have a need to distract one another from the deep work. It takes us 15 minutes every time we get distracted from something. It takes us 15 minutes to get back into whatever work that we were doing. Uh, it's called attention residuals, if you want to look that up. I think Nora Young was talking about it on Spark a little while ago. Uh, we drag the stuff, you know, hey, can you tell me where this resource is? We drag that with us to whatever work that we were doing. Uh, when we feel like things are on fire and we need to check our emails or need to check, like me, I gotta turn this off because you guys are tweeting and that's awesome, thank you for tweeting. Um, we need to, just like, you know what, that just happened. I talked about Twitter and all of a sudden I lost my game. I lost my train of thought. And now I have to try and figure out a way to regain it. This stuff doesn't happen the same way when you're at home by yourself and the only distractions that you have are the ones that you've created for yourself. Um, when we get caught up in politics or gossiping or somebody else's even bad mood, anyone got stuck with somebody else's venting or uh, I like to think of it as um, a really awesome book that I read called No Ego um, by Cy Wakeman. Talks about the BMWs, the bitching, the whining, or the bitching, moaning, whining of our colleagues that create more dramas in the workplace and take us off our productive tracks. Uh, so this is what reality looks like, and there's ways to get a, around it to give people a more productive, healthy, working headspace. Uh, so one, create flexibility through some culture shifts that reward high performance. So, okay, I hope this is an okay crowd to say this. Can we relax the nine to five or this like core hours where we need to be sitting at work? Yes, the right crowd, good. Who is scared of that? Thank you, good. Oh, you're scared of the nine to five. Okay, I'm like, good, call it out if you are actually freaking out about the idea that people won't be as productive if you can't see them working. Um, giving people that kind of space, that flexibility to tend to things in their personal life, it actually makes them a heck of a lot happier, more loyal, and more engaged in the work that they are doing. So I think one of the biggest challenges is we haven't come up with the best measurements for what productivity looks like. We look at things like time spent sitting next to one another and think that we're actually dialed in in that moment, and we're not. We're not all dialed in right now to, the, to what I'm talking about, and that's okay, no, no blame or anything, but we're on our phones, we're looking at something else, we're distracted, right? We're not actually physically really there, so it's not a really good gauge. A better gauge would be for me to ask a question like, what are you learning about what I'm talking about right now? And maybe some of you would have some answers for that, and then that would show a level of engagement. So looking for a different way of measuring productivity. Organizing your business or your nonprofit um, around results. What could be a better result that you're looking for? What is it that you're actually hoping that the person sitting next to you, if you're managing them, or even if they're just a colleague, what are you actually hoping that they will achieve? Whatever that thing is, that's the thing that we should be measuring. And how about let's measure it not based on the time it takes to do it, but on the effectiveness of that. Uh, I say this a lot, um, my Annika and I, we've switched a lot of the things that we do into value-based uh, uh, consulting. So instead of charging by the hour that we work, we charge on the effectiveness of our strategies. And some people balk at that, but, but if you only took 20 minutes to tell me this, then why should I pay you, you know, X amount of dollars to do it? Because like, I just saved us both a couple of hours? I don't know, I feel like that's a solid reason to, to have value-based charging on things. What if we looked at that in offices? What if we looked at I'm gonna say, you know, um, I, I work with a large group, uh, a big sales uh, organization, and uh, they're, they're freaking out, technology driven, freaking out that salespeople aren't gonna be in their desks or walking the floor and making all the calls. And I ask them, you know, it takes a little while to untrain this, but I keep asking them. So the high performing salespeople that you have, 
are they making all the goals that have been set for them? And they say, yeah, yeah, they're actually, they're nailing it. Like, and so your reward for them is pile on more work? I'm like, well, they need to be here until whatever X time and, you know, put in the work. I'm like, sounds like they made the results and the reward for the results should be that they get an opportunity to do whatever else they needed to do because they worked X amount harder. Or let's give them a new title. Let's make them a manager and have them training others if that's what they want because they're intrinsically motivated for that. Let's have them helping others do that instead of forcing them to do more and more of the work. That might actually make them not like the work or not enjoy the company or be as engaged in the work. What do you think about that? Let's test that. So we've got a small pilot project happening where they're testing that to see the results for themselves. What do we think? I wanna, I wanna be able to take at least like a question. Anybody have a question on this one? I've got two more after this. Comment? No, I will keep going then. Let's talk about communication. To work well, we need to be in the same room. How else are you gonna make decisions? Oh, reality. Most of us don't have the same rhythms. Ever notice this? I feel like I'm really pumped up in the morning and you're sitting there going, how are you doing this? My best flow is like in the middle of the afternoon. You want me to show up at the office and like make this decision as you're kind of coming at me with it. Uh, how am I supposed to do that? We don't have the same rhythms and most of us haven't spent a lot of time thinking about our own rhythms and when we work best. If we did, we might notice a few things. Uh, morning people would work earlier in the morning, evening people would work in the evening, and we'd fit in our lives in between it. Nobody is saying that they don't want to contribute meaningful work. I have never heard any one of my clients say, I don't want to contribute meaningful work. I barely hear anyone say, I just want to retire and do nothing. They say, I want to retire so I could do something that feels like contributing more meaningful work in the thing that I care about. Um, but because we're not working in the same rhythms, we aren't in sync with those that we're working with, and yet we're trying to come up with decisions in the same room. Uh, if we were to create a little bit more flexibility, people would feel like they're in more control. And control of our own decision making is vital for creatives, creatives and creativity, especially when it comes to knowledge economies like tech which means we need to take some different actions. We need to develop different communication rituals that not only strengthen and fuel stronger alignment to goals, but we need to develop things that are asynchronous. So who feels like they've got some good asynchronous stuff happening in their workplace, asynchronous communication? Excellent, who feels like they could use some more? Okay. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that even those of us that feel like we've got good systems in place, like we're using Slack or some kind of chat, or we're, we've gotten really good at managing our inboxes and our emails, clearly I'm not that awesome with like thinking that email's the best way to have asynchronous communication internally. Um, but we don't set super clear guidelines. We don't set super clear expectations not on the words that we use, but on the feelings that go behind the words. And I work with an organization in the US right now, and it's been a really great learning environment for me to see the miscommunication that's happening on all cylinders. So this is a uh, organization that is training uh, people who are gonna go into sales. So it's like a boot camp for salespeople in tech. And they have a mindfulness or a mindset coach, that's me, they have a communications coach, that's somebody who's looking at all their written work, and they have an instructor. And we all work in an asynchronous set because we're all working remotely. And that part works, the system is in place. But every time I look at the feedback that a communications coach is giving to this individual, so imagine it's just kind of like having a couple of managers. Every time I look at that feedback, I interpret it one way, the communications coach meant it a different way, and the student is seeing something totally different. And all of us are sitting there on a video Zoom perplexed at why there's so much miscommunication. We have different perceptions. We need to get clearer about that before we just say we've got a great asynchronous system. So I'm often saying grab a Slack chat, grab a, or a Slack call, grab a Zoom, grab a phone call, 
clear up the misunderstandings right away. Anytime I feel unclear, I think, I, I think Eli and I did this. He sent me an email, said like, here's the things I really would like you to come speak. And then he said, let's grab a Zoom to make sure that we're on the same page about what we're doing here. And I said, fantastic. It's important. It only took us like 15 minutes to clear it all up. Not that there was anything to clear up. I'm just saying, Eli, it was great. Um, so let's look for ways to strengthen our asynchronous communication through communications. Uh, and then I put on here, you know, high fives or goals and gratitudes. It's the other thing that happens with people who are location independent. They feel removed from the situation. Is anyone here working location independently or having some flexible time? Good. Okay. Have you ever felt like you're not so much in sync? Ever felt like stuff was happening in the office? Yeah, Eli, <laughs> Eli's waving rapidly back there. I sense that a lot of organizations leave it for the person who is working remotely to be the one that's overly communicating what they're doing, what they got done, uh, bringing their lives into the office. And we miss the part that happens where we're super social when we're in an environment together. We miss the part where we celebrate we miss the part where we, you know, high five each other in the hallway, uh, or you know, cheers each other on a Friday. We don't do it to the same extent when somebody's working remotely. And part of working remotely and creating an engaged environment is creating those systems and the the intent behind it when we're talking with our remote um, with our remote employees. My business partner, Annika, she actually, she texted ahead of here. She's in Germany right now, so I don't know what time it is there, but I think she's watching her niece's musical, uh, so it must be the evening, and she texted, and she's like, good luck, don't forget to do a power pose, which I didn't do because I'm in person instead of doing it virtually, so let's power pose now. Okay, everything's great. Um, and part of that is like, what's the win? What are you celebrating? I know she's gonna text me in about like 15 minutes and say, how did it go? How do you feel? How do you think they received you? Because the idea is to create some of that social movement even though we're doing it outside of office space. Any thoughts, questions? I'm moving quickly so we could take a question. Can you tell I love interaction? Yeah. Yeah, first of all, we celebrate that you're in an organization that's fully distributed. Yes, we celebrate a lot. Celebration is a really important thing because we usually just talk about what needs to be improved instead of appreciating. So what do you do when everybody is dispersed? Um, I'm, I'm going to give a, just an anecdote because I think it's different for each culture, but maybe you'll take something from the story I'm going to share. So when I was leading um, the Yelp team, uh, my team went from Halifax to Honolulu. We were all dispersed and we were over four time zones. And I remember thinking, how am I ever going to recreate things that happen in normal team or, normal team or office environments? Uh, and one of the things I thought of was, well, in teams, we generally do things like, not only do we do off-sites and get-together, so we did those. We did those a few times a year so that we all came together. We did, uh, I would send different people from different places into each other's kinds of zones to spend time together. We would also do things like team building things. So every week when we had our team sync, uh, we would do things like, okay, some of them were silly, some of them worked, some of them didn't work, so I'm saying you gotta test your own culture. Uh, everybody would come up with like a different question that they could ask each other. So, you know, some weeks it would be something like, what's your favorite cocktail? Other weeks it would be like, tell me about your pet or let's all bring our pets onto, we do video conferences, so bring your pets. We would do things that you would normally kind of get in those, uh, in those social moments at work. Uh, during holidays and birthdays, we would send stuff. I remember orchestrating, there was 13 people on my team at that time. I orchestrated a... Uh, holiday Secret Santa. That one was hard and cost a lot in shipping, but I think it actually hit the mark. <laughs> so everyone got, you know, something for everyone else, and then we all jumped on a call and had, I think it was spiked hot chocolate, whatever you wanted that was at your house, uh, and we all opened up these parcels that we had gotten, and they were all local from somebody else's place. And it was just a way of creating that kind of sense of togetherness. So I think anything that you could do to create sense of togetherness is, uh, is worth it, even if the logistics of it fails, as long as the intent is good. <laughs>
Okay, let's talk about time, because I just totally talked about something that was very time intensive. And if you are interested in that or anybody else's, um, just tweet at me and I'm happy to share my logistics of all these different things that I have tried to do working on distributed teams. Um, so it costs too much in time uh, or money or other resources to implement these new systems and behaviors. Who's felt this before? Some, no? Well, I'll just ram through it then, reality. Remote workers save time, money, and energy, both for the employer and the employee. Uh, there's less absenteeism when you have a remote-enabled uh, team. People take shorter breaks. They don't need to because there isn't so much emotional waste that they're trying to shed themselves from. Uh, employers. You're gonna save like $10,000 per head in real estate costs according to some different stats that I have read. That sounds like a good savings. Oh, and also because remote employees are looking for this in terms of flexibility, they will prioritize it over and above anything like, uh, like pay. So you can actually, not that I'm saying to take advantage of somebody, clearly, because we also talk a lot about getting paid for what you're worth and what the value of your work is, um, but it's definitely a benefit and people definitely see it that way. So, just some stats. Two thirds of people want to work from home and 36% would choose it over a pay raise. Whoa, I think that's kind of magical right there. Uh, and 48% uh, of companies that allow flexible work say it's reduced attrition. So if we're talking about talent scarcity and we're talking about turnover challenges, and if you remember the first stat I put up of 89% of Canadian employees willing to leave their current role for a better offer, uh, how much does it cost your organization when you have to hire somebody new or attract somebody new um, or try to keep somebody engaged. Those things we generally don't uh, monitor or measure how much those things cost. There's some good calculators, and I think I put the source down here, uh, workflexibility.org slash the business case for how work flexibility improves recruiting and retention. I'm happy to tweet that afterwards. Um, but taking a look at some of those calculators that are out there to see how much it's costing your organization and if making some adjustments to your communication strategies would actually reduce costs overall. So what can we do? Uh, audit your workplace. Seek out high-performing employees who are craving more flexibility and pilot a remote program that will help them grow your culture to ro towards remote talent. How many folks have tried to pilot something with uh, somebody in their organization because maybe they wanted an extended parental leave or they wanted a sabbatical? Good, okay, a few people. Uh, these things can really help create kind of a guideline for others. And I say choosing somebody who is a high performing employee who already has really great communication skills can help you feel more comfortable with creating this for more people and also provide a mentor for anybody else who's thinking about moving into um, a remote role. What do we think? Thoughts or questions here? Okay, well now what? Um, so ask yourself, what do you wanna do to attract some tech literate talent to your organization? And if you want to, feel free to schedule a little complimentary workplace communication consultation with me. I just love talking to new people, so if anybody wants to schedule some time with me, uh, I will be doing it remotely. We will do it on Appearin, which is my favorite platform for meeting folks. I know I've been talking about Zoom, but Appearin's my favorite one because it requires that you don't have to download a thing, uh, and I'm happy to have any conversations that you all would like and take any questions because I'm two minutes early. <laughs> yeah. That is an amazing question. How do you monitor for mental health in a remote or distributed environment? Um, I think number one, it's the frequency of check-ins. We can see these things when, or hopefully, I think we should be monitoring this in-house as well. Um, we can see it a little bit more. We can read body language a bit more. I think the power of questions, though, transcends being in the same place and same, you know, same geographical place. So I would add some more compelling kind of power questions to your regular check-ins. First, 
With remote employees especially, I would not, I would not let a week go by where I am not speaking to them either on the phone or on video. Yes, yes, I know, it's so hard just keeping those one-on-ones, it's so hard, life is busy. But it's so vital to keeping that sort of engagement level with them, not based around did they get the work done or if they missed a deadline or something like that. It's really based around how are you but you gotta put the intent behind it. It's not just the how are you question. It's the, tell me about what you're really celebrating this week. What's been the biggest challenge for you? Where are you on a scale of one to 10 in terms of engagement to the work that you're doing? Not our company, not me, the work that you're contributing. What would make your work more meaningful? What else is happening in your life? What's been going on um, that's been getting you stuck? What's been going on that's been getting you going? Any questions like that that go a lot more specific than just the standard, you're good, I'm good, great, let's talk about the work, that's the kind of stuff that's gonna get some richness in there. Also, I would say for both people, we gotta go into it distraction-free. Now, it's rule number one, turn off any of the other pings that are happening, silence everything, and be there with that person. Uh, I kind of was trying to do that just now and I'm just talking to you because it's your question, I'm like, canceling out everybody else just for that moment to show that I'm really present there. Do that for each person that you're working with too. Helpful? Okay. One more minute, one more question, yeah. Yeah, what if your organization has a poor experience with this in the past? I get this one a lot. Uh, and I, I, you know, first I think about anecdotals or something like that or um, comparisons. You've probably had a poor experience hiring someone in the past as well, yeah? probably had a poor experience like having somebody quit or being let go. Yeah, we still hire them, we still quit, we still let go. I would say when we have a poor experience, we need to look at what worked in the experience, what didn't work, and reshape it. There's always a chance. I loved what Tracy was saying about failing. It was a fail, great. What do we learn from the fail of that experience and how do we move forward? It doesn't mean that working remotely or in distributed ways fails because there's a lot of examples where it is working really successfully. What can we learn from them? Because clearly we missed out on something. Uh, I'm big advocate for asking the questions and doing that, that post-mortem on the whole experience of it to learn how we can get better. If you want to grab me afterwards and talk specifically about it, I'm happy to share some more based on your situation. Yeah. Ooh, five more minutes. It's like a gift. Yeah. How do you engage teams that are not interested in the technology? Okay. So one, I would say um, how you brought that team on. Was it an inherited team? Were they high? Okay, good. I was like, because if you're hiring for people that are remote, then they, you're going to want to have them be people who enjoy that kind of communication. So I would say go back to the hiring process and look at the kinds of questions that we're asking and the kinds of things that someone that we are in interview process with are exhibiting that show that they would make a fantastic remote individual. So I would say the exact same things even for a new or for an inherited team. The workplace, whatever the workplace is, it has shifted to working this way. If a team or an individual isn't on board with that, my first, first I would reset expectations. The expectation is that we are gonna be using Slack. The rest of the company is on board with this or we're trying something new, this is the expectation. And then of course, what do you think, team or employee? Get the feedback, let's listen to what they're really feeling about it. If they're feeling, sometimes we just want to be acknowledged. So if the acknowledgement is there and now they're moving forward, amazing. If they're not willing to get on board, the next thing that I would say is, what are you willing to do to get on board? And then I would shut up and let them have to dig their own holes. I'm a little bit of a no bullshit person. Uh, and I think it actually works on most people because when we coddle them and we say it's okay to not move the way the business is moving, we're also giving them permission to not move in the way that our organization is moving in terms of, um, in terms of uh, business direction. Oh, so it's okay that you don't use Slack. I guess it's also okay, okay that you don't want to meet this fundraising goal. Okay, that's not okay. 
hopefully that's helpful. And again, come see me afterwards if you want more. Yeah. Yeah, the, so you're right. When we're just typing things out, and usually when we're doing it a bit rapid fire on a chat, uh, we're only kind of gauging, I think it's about 7% of what's actually being said, and all we have is the written communication. Now, I don't necessarily think that we need to get in person to solve conflict, depending on where it's escalated to. I think we can catch it a lot faster. So one, uh, I love terminology like creating a communication alliance, learning what the other person or other people, what they mean when they say something. Asking questions in the text, saying something like, it seems like, or it seems like, or I'm perceiving that you mean this. Am I right or am I wrong? Giving them the opportunity to kind of re-clarify and get stronger at communicating with you. I would say a big thing in all kinds of feedback and conflict resolution to me is a feedback cycle. Um, is it's not about how, how we are coming across what I think I'm saying. It's how much I believe, how much I know that you are resonating with it, whoever my intended audience is. So if I didn't understand you, it's not because I'm dense or have a different perspective. It's because the way that you said it to me didn't resonate on me. This is neutral. I'm not, there's no blame on it. It's just oh, the way you said it did not, it just didn't resonate with me. Can we talk about how the two of us speak together so that we know that we're on the same page? When I know that you're making a joke and you don't put the happy face emoji, I can just input happy face emoji in my head because I know that that is you joking. It's us having that, that conversation. So I would set up expectations up front by designing communication alliances. Like I'll often say to a new client that I'm working with, I'll say something like, uh, so um, I have a tendency to be no bullshit. Uh, is that okay with you? Because I might come across as curt if, if I don't put that up front. Could you let me know if I'm coming across too curtly? And then let's say they don't because let's say they're um, I don't know, let's say they're ashamed or they just didn't want to share anything with me. I'll say to them, hey, remember when I said that sometimes I can come across too curtly and I wanted you to let me know? I just want to invite you to let me know that again because clearly you didn't hear it the first time that I said it. So I want to say it again and I want to say it in a bunch of different ways. I also want to try to adjust my way of being with you if you're feeling like you're getting something different from me than what you were wanting, but this is both of us in the relationship combined as opposed to just my way of communicating or your way of receiving. So start sooner. If you notice those things, I would also say just jump on the phone. <laughs> you don't have to get in person. Just quickly have a quick phone call. And I know we're over, so I'm going to stop now. Ta-da. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>